Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we love your word. There's power in your word. Lord, it's not about our opinion. It's about your word. Your word has the power to bring life. It has the power to sustain. It has the power to feed us. And so we thank you. We love your word, Lord God. And we love how the word of God just transforms us and, and um, carries us and strengthens us, Lord God. And today, Lord, as we talk about um, the f very foundational stuff of your word, Lord God, that, Lord, it, it'll cause us to even get our roots down even deeper and to under understand you and what you've done for us even more. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, as you know, uh, when I went to um, Africa recently, to Uganda, I uh, was part of a, a we had a ministers, pastors and leaders training, and there were 200 um, pastors there. And when David knew that I was coming, he said, I want you to come and preach on grace. I said, I would love to preach on grace. The thing is, you can't just turn up at a church and just preach on grace. That is why we're doing this course. Because just preaching grace alone leaves a lot of unanswered questions. And so what I did is I had three sessions and I preached on righteousness or righteous living and then identity and then on grace. And so the messages that I did in Uganda is actually what I'm going to do with us. Amen? And I know a lot of you know and understand grace is really good, but it's so good just to hear it again, you know, because we, we live in a world which is so opposed to, you know, the grace of God and actually what happened. You know, when I was growing up in school, the slogan was, if it's to be, it's up to me. <laughs> and so we're told, you know, if you're going to get anywhere in this world, it's up to you, it's all up to you. Well, we find when you get into the grace message, it's actually all up to God. <laughs> and so... Um, so I when I do when I taught I taught on righteousness then identity then grace and then left a lot of um, room for questions on grace but let me encourage you to come to the course because that's where all your questions can be answered amen and um, if you do you know if I went to if I went to Africa and just preached on grace I would have left I would have it would have been a campaign I would have had the camp and the pastor would have had the pain when I left <laughs> And so, um, so what we're going to do, we're going to talk about righteousness or about righteous living. So, as you know, foundations are a very important part of a building. And I don't know about you, I mean, I've been a Christian for now 51 years. And what has surprised me, especially in the, you know, being a pastor, is to see people that I knew who I, I, f I thought were pretty well versed in the word, really, you know, had an understanding of God, but when the storms came, how they, they were just so shaken. I mean, one person who, you know, he was very much in a, a hyper-faith doctrine, when he got sick, he was trying everything, you know, I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm doing everything just to try to, you know, to get my healing, and I actually said to him, I said, what you're not doing is resting. <laughs> I said, you are trying so hard and trying to apply everything to get your healing and all that's happening is you're actually making yourself worse. I said, you just need to rest. I said, if you don't, you'll end up in hospital and you will rest. <laughs> and so I saw that some of his foundations were very shaky because he was actually trying to do everything to get his healing rather than just resting in the finished work of God. Amen? And so, you know, as you know, we built this, this house out the back and one of the things when we built the house is God said, everything you need I will provide. But just about everybody that I know has built a house, either, you know, it ends up being more money or they run out of money. And when I was in Uganda, the really strange thing was that every third building, especially new building, was incomplete because they ran out of money. <laughs> and it was crazy to see like the bottom story and then a top story which just had bits of it but was never finished because they ran out of money. And so uh, when we started to build, we put our foundations down, we put the concrete pad down and we put the, the stilts up and we'd spent half our money. And the enemy's going, see, I told you that's what was going to happen. It didn't happen. God actually provided. Amen? But the thing was, what you see, most of the money goes into what you don't see. It goes actually into the ground, into, you know, the Bible says build your house upon a rock. We made a rock out there. It's called concrete. <laughs> Otherwise, we're building on sand. But the thing is, we've been through floods and storms, and that thing has not moved. Amen? Because of the foundations. And we actually had, the, if I can tell you the way we built it, if you just put piers on each corner, if one sinks, the whole lot would move. 
but the whole foundation was actually designed so that one can't move without having to move the whole thing and it's just not going to happen and so we Whenever it's windy, when, when there were, we had the floods back in 2017, we knew we were secure, that the house was secure, or because the house is actually tied um, to the foundations. Amen? And so foundations are so important. In fact, there's a few things we did in the foundation. We actually put a Bible in our foundations. Uh, just be, I was there as they were finishing the concrete. I said, just before you finish, I actually want to put a Bible in there. So we've got a youth Bible and we put it in. There's, so there's a Bible buried in there. Our house is built on the Word of God. Amen? <laughs> Literally. And then we actually put it... I can show you later if you want. We put two scriptures written in the corner. One is there's no other foundation laid, that which is Jesus Christ. Amen? And the one to build your house upon the rock. So we were serious about our foundations. Amen? And the Bible is serious about foundations. So one of, one of the key foundations in the Bible is righteousness. So the first scripture we're going to put up, um, you can follow it on the screen or, or actually in your Bibles. And sorry, I'm going to... Are we okay here? Because normally I'm back further with the camera. All right, okay, look this way sometimes. All right. So Romans 5.17 says, For if by one man's offence death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Now that scripture tells me that righteousness is actually a gift. <laughs> it's called the gift of righteousness. Those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign through Jesus Christ. So if we understand that righteousness is a gift, it's actually going to help us reign through life. Amen? Now... Let me show you how this works. So say, say this was a brand new Bible and say I decided to give this to James and I said, James, I want to bless you with this Bible. Here you go, take it. All right? And um, yeah, absolutely. You know what he just said? Free Bible, right? So imagine if I said to James, James, that Bible is, a bit, is worth $100. So for the next 10 weeks, if you give me $10 a week, we'll be square. What's he going to say? I'm confused. <laughs> I thought you said it was a gift. He said it, free Bible. But I'm saying, no, it's not free. You have to pay me back for it. That's what we do with righteousness. I'll have it back, thanks, because <laughs> I need it. <laughs> That's what we do with righteousness. Righteousness is a free gift, but we keep thinking we have to earn it. We keep thinking we have to pay for it. We think that you know, to, to be righteous, we have to do things to become righteous. Amen? You know, you know what I'm talking about? But when we do that, we're negating the fact that it's actually a gift. It was a gift that was given by God, which we don't have to earn, that we don't have to pay for. I'll tell you how it works. So the fact is that you are righteous because you've been given the gift of righteousness. That doesn't mean sometimes you don't act unrighteously, but it doesn't change who you are. So what happens if we act we do something that's a little bit unrighteous? We feel we have to pay for that and work our way back to righteous standing with God. Amen? So all the things that we've... So, so, so then we do one thing wrong and we think we've got to work our way back to being right standing with God. Or the other thing happens is that we, we're doing all these good things and we do one wrong thing and we're out of righteous standing with God. But the Bible says that it's a gift. <laughs> and it's a gift, it's a gift, it's ours. We don't have to earn it, we don't have to try to get it back. It's been freely given by God. Amen? So when you got given your salvation and you got given the grace of God, you also got given your righteousness. That happened when you got saved. Amen? Amen. So, even, yeah, here's the thing. The Bible says salvation is our gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So let's go to Romans 1, 16, 17. This is, uh, was a world-changing scripture. This actually was uh, the reformation of the church came out of this scripture. And so it says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. Now, verse 17 is what I want to focus on. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now let me show you this in the Good News Translation, because this translation for this particular scripture really brings this out well. So this is what it says. I have complete confidence in the gospel. 
In other words, I have complete um, confidence in the good news because it's God's power to save all who believe. Right? Not, not my power to save me, God's power to save everyone who believes. Right? The, first the Jews and then the Gentiles. But look at this. The gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. It is through faith from beginning to end, as the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. Doesn't that describe it well? This is the good news. God did something to put him right with me. <laughs> I've been, the law was us trying to put us right with God, and we never could do it. It's a plumb line. It's 100% perfection. We couldn't do it. So God had to do something beyond the law, which was to send his son Jesus Christ to die for us. And the good news is, is when we accept him as Lord and Saviour, God has put himself right with us by what he did by sending his son to die for us. Amen? Isn't that good? <laughs> it's something I couldn't do for myself. So because of Jesus Christ, I am every day in right standing with God. No matter what I do, no matter what I say, no matter where I go, I am in right standing with God because that is something God did through his son, something I couldn't do by myself. Isn't that powerful? That is the gospel. That is the good news. You know, and every other religion is about working your way to God, trying to get yourself in right standing with a higher power, and God did it the opposite way. He actually came down through his son and put himself right with me. That is the good news. Amen? And that's the power to save people because I can get saved. I can believe that. I, I find it hard to believe that I can get myself in right standing with God because how can a futile person get themselves right with an infinite God? How can we do that? And that was the question that actually Martin Luther asked. How, how, does, a, how do, does a person be in right standing with a holy God? And then he read this scripture and the lights came on. He said, it's actually not about me trying to get myself right with God. It's about God got himself right with me. And actually, he was the one who did it. And then he goes, all I have to do is believe that by faith. That's all I have to do. Because the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. That means every day, every morning, I have to, by faith, believe that I am in right standing with God. Every single day. And why? Because of what Jesus did and because it's a gift. Amen? The enemy will try to tell you you're not right standing with God. The enemy will try to say, you know, you can't accept the blessing, you can't get the blessings of God because look at what you've done. And so he focuses on your condition where God focuses on our position. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about identity. So let's break, let's break this down. So the gospel, the good news, it's the power to save us. It's so powerful that it can save everyone. It's something I'm not ashamed of. In fact, it's something I have complete confidence in. I can have confidence in the fact that, that someone can get saved because it's actually God putting himself right with them. If I, if I had to believe that they've got to get themselves right with God, I don't have confidence in that. I would struggle with that myself. So I wouldn't have confidence in that. And then it says that the gospel reveals how God put himself right. So this is a question that I ask. When um, often if I'm witnessing with people, and it's very simple. I just say them to them, do, do you believe in heaven? Most people do. I was talking to a lady in Coolangatta who was actually trying to sell shoes to Brenda, and she was saying, um, oh yeah, you know, heaven, I, I'd like to think I'm going to heaven. And I said, okay, can we talk about that for a moment? And I said, um, you'd like to think you'd get to heaven? I said, yeah, okay. I said to him, do you think heaven's a perfect place? I said, yeah, of course heaven's a perfect place. I said, well, do you think people are perfect? No, definitely they're not. I said, well, how can an imperfect person go to a perfect place? And they're like, yeah. And it actually then puts the, the, you know, it puts the question that, oh, maybe I won't get to heaven because I'm not a perfect person and I'm trying to get to a perfect place. And I said, well, actually, here's the, here's the, the good news is that an imperfect, a perfect man came and died on your behalf and gave you his perfection so that you can actually go to a perfect place. That's the good news. <laughs> Very simple, hey? She actually understood that. She goes, wow, okay. I said, yeah, all, all of, all the, you know, every man is imperfect, but there was one perfect one. He actually stood in your place, took the punishment of that, 
But see, and see, this is the thing where people miss, is that when people think, okay, I got, it's all only about salvation, if it's only about a salvation and not righteousness, the day you get saved, then it's like, okay, I'm, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. But what happens the next day? <laughs> what happens when you actually start to sin? I was saved from my sin yesterday, but I've sinned again. Oh, I'm not going there. But that, see, it's only half a salvation. That's what happened with the children of Israel. They came out of the world, but they didn't go into the promised land. Amen? And so it's actually both because what happens is that we get saved is that um, our sin is taken away, but then we receive the gift of righteousness, and we'll talk about that in a moment, how that's imputed to us, and then, see, the question is, when are you fit for heaven? The day you got saved. Because <laughs> the day you got saved is when you actually, Hebrews says, that he is perfect by one, by, uh, by one sacrifice, he is perfected forever, those who are being sanctified. So you are made perfect the day you got saved, which meant the day you got saved, you're fit for heaven. That's why, that's why the guy on the cross, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because when he accepted Jesus Christ, he was fit for heaven right then and there. Amen? Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5.12, we call it the great exchange. For, him who made, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That was the exchange that took place. And so if we don't believe and walk in faith in this righteousness, we're actually um, diminishing what happened at the cross. Jesus took all that judgment on himself so that we could actually have his righteousness. Amen? Amen. So let's have a look at Romans uh, 3, 21 to 26. Paul's very good on this stuff. He, it's, um, yeah, he, he talks about it so much. But the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets witnessed that Jesus would come and that we would receive his righteousness. It says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there's no difference. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as a propitiation, don't let that big word, that just means an appeasement, by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So the wonderful thing in the past with Passover, he passed over their sins. But now with Jesus, that's why John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen? Amen. Hebrews says, you know, priests would actually minister daily with um, bulls and goats, but could never, that could never take away their sin. So atonement is an Old Testament word. It's not a New Testament word because atonement means to cover. Their sins were covered, but in Jesus our sins are taken away. Amen? Amen. And not only our sins are taken away, but he has given us his righteousness. So Paul loves to talk about Abraham. Well, the Pharisees like to talk about Abraham, and he loved to talk to them about him because they said, oh, wasn't he a good guy? You know, look at what Abraham did. And he said, no, he wasn't. <laughs> And so, um, so Abraham is, and we'll see why in a minute, Abraham is called the, fa the father of all who believed. He believed the promise and it was accounted to him as righteousness that through him all the nations shall be blessed. So he actually believed in Jesus, looked forward to the cross, and that was accounted to him as righteousness. We look back to the cross and it's accounted to us as righteousness. Do you know that Abraham was preached the same gospel that you and I were preached? Have a look at this in Galatians 3 8. Because God preached to Abraham the good news about Jesus Christ, and it was he believed on it, and it actually was accounted to him as righteousness. So it says, Galatians 3 8, in the scripture, foreseeing the cross, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Amen. Abraham got preached the gospel by God. <laughs> and he preached about the cross, how the, the, the Gentiles would come in, and, and about how 
um, all the nations shall be blessed through Jesus Christ. He preached it to Abraham. Abraham believed it, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Amen? Isn't that cool? So people go, oh, you know, well, what about before Jesus? Well, people could believe in Jesus even before Jesus came, and it would be accounted to them as righteousness. Isn't that amazing? So they got the gift of righteousness the same that way that we do. So Romans um, 4, 5 to 8, talks about imputed righteousness. So it says, To him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. That's interesting. We think it should say justifies the godly, justifies the Christian. No, it actually justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those who law, whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So how does this work? So how does imputed righteousness work? So imagine you had a debt of $100,000. And you go to the ATM machine and you want to draw some money out and it says, no, you have a $100,000 debt. And then the next day you think, well, I know I've got a debt, but I'll try again. You put your card in the machine and you find not only has the debt been paid, but you've actually got $10 billion in your bank account. What are you going to think? It's like, wow, not only are my debts paid, but I now have enough money to last me a lifetime that I'll never, ever be in debt again. And that's what happened with imputed righteousness. When God saved you, he paid the debt. Amen? He paid the debt, the penalty that the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But when he imputed righteousness into us, he, he gave us righteousness to actually last us a whole lifetime. Amen? Amen. That's how it works. Now the thing is, is that um, when it comes to righteousness... That is the very, it is the foundation of our relationship with God. Our relationship with God is based on the fact, and every blessing from God comes from the fact that we are in right standing with him. Amen? Because I am in right standing with him. It's funny, I was talking to someone the other day, and don't get me wrong if you like to, you know, if you like to pray and like cover yourself in the blood, that's okay. But a lady was saying to me, oh, you know, do, do you cover yourself in the blood? I said, I don't need to, I'm in Christ. I'm actually already covered in his blood. Do you know what I mean? It's not something I have to physically do. Some people like to do that and that's okay. But for me, I don't, I actually, oh yeah, because that's right. I said, I went to Adjumani and I was there and it was in the red zone and blah, blah, blah. She said, oh, did you cover yourself in the blood? I said, no, I'm already covered in the blood. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? And so, it, you know, we are in Christ and every day that I, that I am awake, or every, I know that I'm in right standing with God, no matter where I go, no matter what I do. So my relationship with him is based on the fact that I'm in right standing with him. And so every blessing comes from the fact that I'm in right standing with God. My relationship comes from the fact that I'm in right standing with him. But it's nothing that I've done. It's all he, what he did through his son. He made a way that I could be in right standing with him every single day of my life, no matter what I, no matter if I pray today or kick the cat instead or whatever. So, so if we think, if we don't understand that, we're on this roller coaster all the time, you know. Today I might be in favour with God because everything's going okay, but what if something goes wrong? And that can go moment by moment. You can start the morning thinking, I'm good, God and I, we're okay. But by the afternoon, oh, I don't really feel like I am. And that's when the enemy wants to come in and have a go. That's why the Bible says we can come boldly to the throne room of grace and find grace in a time of need. When do we need him most? When we're stuffed up. <laughs> But why can we come boldly? Because we're in right relationship with him. Even when we do the wrong thing, we're in right relationship with him and we can come boldly to the throne. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So what it's saying is that this imputed righteousness is that your sin is not counted against you and your righteousness is actually imputed to you. So look at David. David, from the Old Testament, understood this. He actually said... Because he said, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered, and blessed is the man to the, that the Lord will not impute sin. So, do you know that David was a murderer and an adulterer? You know, with what happened with Bathsheba, not only did, was there adultery, 
but there was also he sent the husband out on the out on the front line so that was murder do you know that under the law he should have been stoned for what he did but he understood something god justifies the ungodly those things that he did were ungodly acts but God justified them. So just like Abraham, he believed in Jesus, he who justifies, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And David says, I'm blessed, and so is every man and woman who believes in Jesus, because your sin's not counted against you, and righteousness is imputed to you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. He understood that. He understood that. He actually said, I'd rather, I'd rather be, you know... Um, uh, have God's justice than actually man's justice because God is a righteous judge so in Matthew 3.15 um, Jesus comes to John to get baptised in water and John's confused because he's, this is a sinner's baptism and he's like you're the one who's taking the sins of the world you're the sinless one why are you asking me to baptise you and Jesus says this he says Jesus answered and said, Permit it to be so, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John allowed it. Why did he say that? Because what he was doing, it was a picture of what was going to happen about that great exchange. He was actually taking the sin of the world and, being, and taking that into the grave. And then he was actually, um, so the sinless one was actually being going in a sinner's baptism so those who are sinners can actually have imputed righteousness. Amen? Because it's interesting, this is, that it, this must be so to for fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness because it was prophetic of what was about to happen when he died on the cross. Amen? And then, of course, you know, we... And then, and then so he does that, and then at Jordan, you know, uh, it's a picture of cross, when he went under the water, it was like a burial, and out of the water was a resurrection, and then the heaven opened and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And it was all fitting for us, because when we come into Christ, our old life is buried, we're raised anew, and God says, this is my son and my daughter in whom I am well pleased. Every day of your life, he is well pleased with you. He is in right relationship with you because Jesus did what was fitting for all righteousness to happen for us. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. <laughs> That's why they call it amazing grace. Amen. Okay. So this is what Jesus did because in John 12, 31 to 32... It says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be judged and cast out. And it says, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. Now, next verse. Oh yeah, all men to myself. Now if you have a New King James Version, you'll see that that word men is actually in italics. That means when they did the translation, what they did is sometimes they inserted words like as and if and different things just to bring... The meaning out because you know as, as if you've translated any language sometimes you've got to add to the sentence structure just to to get it in there but I've got an interlinear Bible which actually just has it word for word and the actual um, original transcript of that says if I be lifted up I will draw all to myself peoples or men has been inserted what that actually is saying if you read the whole scriptures the judgment of this world has now come and the ruler is judged if I be lifted up, I will draw all. What's he saying? Judgment. I will draw all judgment to myself. That's actually what Jesus was saying. Because he said, if I be lifted on a cross, I will actually be a judgment magnet. That every sin that has been committed and will ever be committed, I'm actually taking that upon myself. Amen? Amen. So you don't walk in the judgment of God. I tell you why. Because if God judged you for your sin, he would be an unjust God. Because he's judged all, it's already been judged at the cross. God cannot, you cannot go to a court and have, there, there's something that's happened and a person gets judged and they go, okay, we're going to actually make that person pay for that as well. That would be totally unjust. And so this is, when I look at that, I see the righteous judgment of God is that God has judged Jesus for my sin and I'm no longer in, in, in a place of judgment anymore. And do you know what that makes me? 
less judgmental towards people. <laughs> because if God would do that for me, how can I then go and judge somebody? Jesus talks about it in a parable. Parable. Where, you know, I didn't deserve Jesus to take the judgment for me. I didn't deserve for him to take the wrath of God for me. That was my sin that I committed. I deserved that. But he did that for me. So how can I actually judge somebody else? How can I be judgmental towards somebody else when I've received no judgment and all, what I have received is his righteousness? Amen? And it makes you, when you, the more you understand that and think about it, the less judgmental you are because how can I judge someone when, I, when Jesus did so much for me that I didn't deserve? Amen? And not only did he not judge me for my sin, he actually imputed to me his righteousness and every, every other Christian as well. Okay, we'll keep going. We'll, are you okay with this? We're going to go a little bit longer. Is that okay? Because there's a bit more to get through. So Romans 10.3 says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So the Jews were ignorant of God's righteousness, and unfortunately many churches are the same. They're ignorant to the righteousness of God and they're trying to establish their own righteousness through behaviour and performance. But how sad that is. You know, that, that's the trick of the enemy. The enemy will try to get you to, um, to perform and to, to get something that you actually already have. He did it in the Garden of Eden. He said to Eve, oh, God doesn't want you to eat from that fruit because if you do, you'll be like him and God doesn't want to do that. that they were already like him. <laughs> they had dominion over all the earth. They were made in the image of God. They couldn't have been more like God than God himself. And here's the devil tempting them to try to attain something they already had. Amen? It's the trick of the enemy. And so the enemy tries to get us to earn our righteousness or try to do it through behavior or performance when it's actually something that was already been given as a gift. All we've got to do is believe it and live in it by faith. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. I'm going, to, I'm going to want to just give you a example with Abraham. So I was saying before that the, the, the Jews and that they used to love saying, oh, Abraham, where he was our father, he was such a good guy. And Paul knew. He said, no, it's not about his behavior. It's not about his performance. He understood that his righteousness was imputed by Jesus Christ. That's why he was righteous. Not because of what he did, but because who he was. Amen? So let's have a look at something that he did. So let's quickly go through Genesis 12, 10 to 20. So we know the story that um, God said, go to a place where I'll show you, and off he went. He left and he got to Canaan. He got there and there was a, there was a famine, and so he goes, I'm out of here, right? And that's where we pick it up here in verse 12. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abraham went to Egypt. He went to dwell there because the famine was severe in the land. It came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you're a woman of be a beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see that, they will say, this, this is his wife and they'll kill me, but, they, but they'll let you live. Please say you're my sister, that you may dwell with me for your sake, and I may live because of you. Two problems. One, he didn't trust God for his provision, because when he got to, there was a famine, God sent him there. Do you think if God sent you there, he's able to provide for you? Absolutely. And he didn't trust God for his protection because he said to his Sarah, Sarah, tell him you're my sister. He basically prostituted his wife. Okay? So was he a good man? No, that's pretty bad behavior, really. Okay. I don't think Brenda would be too happy if I went to, took her to Uganda and said, um, hey, she's my sister. King, you can have her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it was when Abraham came to Egypt and the Egyptians saw the woman, she was beautiful, the princes of Pharaoh saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. So they took her away to, to basically the king of Egypt. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house and, he, and not only that, Abraham got, got um, livestock, he got sheep and male donkeys. He's like, oh, not only did I save my life out of this little, uh, little venture, I'm getting blessed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. And Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this that you've done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, that I might have taken her as my wife? He said, I might have married her, 
and she's already married to you and you've lied. Why have you done this? And so now, therefore, she, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. And Abraham went from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, with Lot to the south. And Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. I've got a question. Who sinned, Abraham or Pharaoh? Abraham. Who, did God, who, who was God going to plague? Pharaoh. <laughs> who did God bless? Abraham. Why? Because God does not impute sin, he imputes righteousness. Amen? Now if you've heard me say it's okay to sin, you have, you've been listening wrong. I never said that. Because if you sin and play with fire, you'll get burnt. But here's the thing. God does not impute your sin to you if you, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap from the flesh and destruction. God actually want, is wanting us to live a new way of life because here's the thing, and, and um, it talks about it in Romans, end of Romans 5 and into Romans 6. It says where sin abounds, grace superabounds. So what, and then in chapter 6 of Romans he says, so what shall we say then? Should we sin that grace may abound? He said certainly not. And if you actually have the old J.B. Phillips version, the English version, it says, what a ghastly thought, <laughs> that we would sin so that grace can abound. Because then he goes on to say, why would you do that? Because sin brings destruction, it brings shame, it brings guilt. Jesus came to save you from that. But the wonderful thing is that we, can, we walk in the right... Abraham got blessed even when he did the wrong thing because, because of imputed righteousness. Amen? Amen. Now... You think that Abraham would have learnt that lesson, but 20 years later he did exactly the same thing with King Abimelech. <laughs> and we won't go through the scripture, but this time when he said to Sarah, tell him you're my sister, King Abimelech had a, a dream in the night and God said to him, you're a dead man. <laughs> it's actually, um, I'll show you, it's in verse, yeah, in, in verse um, 6. Actually, you can put it up. We'll scroll down to it. So Genesis 20, verse 6, it says, God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know, um, I know that you did this from the... Uh, oh, hold on, no, verse 2. God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, indeed you're a dead man because of the woman who you've taken because she is a man's wife. He's like, I didn't know that. He said she was his sister. <laughs> and, then, um, but, and so he didn't go near her. And he said, Lord, would you slay a righteous nation? And he did, I didn't know, you know, anyway, and I'm innocent. So God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this and in the integrity of your heart, for also withheld from you, I withheld you from sinning against me, therefore I did not let you touch her. He said, restore the man's wife, for he's a prophet, and he will pray for you and you shall live, but if you don't restore her, you'll die and, and, and everything. And so um, verse 16 of um, the same verse it says behold I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver indeed which vindicates you and um, and I, he went on his way so Abraham Abraham sinned Abimelech was the one who was told you're a dead man if you touch this guy and he said and this guy who sins going to pray for you and you're going to bless him <laughs> so what do we do that do we go and sin no but when the Bible says we are not disqualified from the blessing of God because Jesus qualifies us for his blessing. Amen? Even when we do the wrong thing, it does not disqualify us. I'll tell you what happens. You know, people have said, oh, if you do the wrong thing, you know, God's blessing is not going to flow in your life. I, don't, I disagree with that. What it is, is this. The blessing of God is over your life every single day because you are the righteousness of God and because what Jesus Christ has done. Amen? But what we can do is we can restrict it by the way that we live. So it's like there's a hose and I'm actually squeezing the end of it because I'm count... Yeah, if his life is flowing but I'm counteracting it with death by the way that I live, I'm actually restricting his flow. Does that make sense? But I'm restricting the flow, not God. God's flow is constantly there because I'm constantly in right relationship with God, that's my position, and it's all because what Jesus Christ has done. But my life and the way that I walk and act can actually restrict that. 
The, the truth is, if I walk in the blessing and actually live a life worthy of what God has done for me, then I'm just letting the blessing flow. Amen. Does that make sense? So, Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we just thank you that right now we're in righteous standing with you. We're in right standing with you. All because of Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross. All we have to do is believe it. And all we have to do is walk in it, Lord God. And we just thank you, Lord God, for what you've done. We thank you, Lord, that it was complete. We thank you, Lord God, it's a gift. Something that we don't have to earn or try to keep earning when we receive it. And Lord, I just pray today, Lord, that this, will, this foundational teaching will just bring a new level of freedom, Lord, in our lives. To understand that you love us, that you are well pleased with us, Lord God, and that your blessings flow over our lives. And Lord God, our... We want to actually live a life that is worthy of that because it costs you everything to give us that right standing with you. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to add one more thing. I've got a daughter. And if I said to my daughter, you know, like, I love you. I adore you. You're, you're amazing. Every day, you know, I just, I just want to pour my blessing out on you and just want to spend time with you. And it doesn't matter what you do, I just love you. How she walks and acts shows me if she actually believes that or not. She'll go, yeah, yeah, nah, that's fine, and then just go, yeah, well, whatever, I don't actually, I don't, I don't think that's true, whatever. But, or, how she responds to me shows me if she really truly believes the fact that no matter what she does, I, I love you as my daughter. And that's how it is with us. We, all we have to do is believe it by faith and walking it, and our relationship with God shows us actually whether we really believe it. Amen? And that's all God's looking for.